who specializes in selling comics and graphic novels into school and public libraries in Toronto. Um, we have a really distinguished and very international panel here. And I'm just going to quickly go down the line and introduce everyone to you. Uh, first of all, uh, we have Liniers here. He's from Argentina and has published his daily comic, Macanudo in Buenos Aires, La Nación, since 2002. Uh, he was first published in the U.S. by Toon Books in 2013 with The Big Wet Balloon, which was nominated for an Eisner Award and selected as one of Parent Magazine's top 10 books of the year. His 2015 follow-up Toon Book, written and drawn by Henrietta, received five-star reviews and the Mildred L. Batchelder Honor Award from the ALA. He now lives in Vermont as the artist in residence at the Center for Cartoon Studies with his wife and three young daughters. Next in line, we have Elise Cravel. Um, she's an author and illustrator from Montreal, Quebec. After studying graphic design, she pursued a career writing and illustrating children's books, where her quirky and charming characters quickly won the hearts of children and adults worldwide. In 2012, uh, Elise received the Governor General's Literary Award for her book, The Great Antonio, about the famous Montreal strongman with a heart of gold. A prolific artist, she currently has over 30 children's books to her name, which have been translated into a dozen languages including I Want a Monster and the Disgusting Critters series. Elise Crivell still lives in Montreal with her spouse, two daughters, cats, and a few spiders. Uh, next, we have Marguerite Abouet, whose bio is here. So there we go. Marguerite Abouet is the author of the popular Aya series of graphic novels from Drawn Quarterly, illustrated by Clément Oupéry, as well as the picture book Akisi from No Grau, illustrated by Mathieu Sapin. I was recently adapted to an animated film. Aboué was born in Abidjan, Ivory Coast, and at the age of 12, she was sent to study in France. She now lives in a suburb of Paris and remains closely connected to her country of her birth. Uh, next, we have Nazalie, sorry. No worries. <laughs> Nazalie Curaguin, um, and she's here um, both interpreting for Marguerite and as an expert in her own right. Uh, she works with Europe Comics, which is a 13-partner pan-European alliance supported by the European Commission and held together by the desire to spread the European graphic novel heritage around the world. Europe Comics, as an organization, has many facets and goals, not least of which is to provide readers and professionals with wide-ranging information, such as the history of European comics, a global calendar of comics events, academic studies, market overviews, and more. And finally, um, we have Teresa Radice, who was Stefano Tocconi, respectively scriptwriter and illustrator, joined forces for the first time in 2003 for a story entitled La Gamme Invisible, beginning a fruitful partnership for both professionally and personally. They have collaborated with famous comics magazines like Topolino, Witch, PK, MM, X Mickey, Fairies, and Wonder City for the biggest Italian publishers, Disney Italia, PM, EL, De Agostini, BNC, Delali, and Terra di Mezzo. They love to meet and discuss with young readers and frequently lead classes and seminars of creative writing and drawing in primary and secondary schools. The Europe Comics catalog features the children's adventure series Globe Trotting Viola, which there are lovely cards for near the door. Um, so that's our panel. Here they are. And I wanted to start this discussion. I think um, we're going to talk about sort of the different comics cultures around the world and how they have informed uh, this panel's work. And then we'll maybe go on to sort of questions of reception and presence in libraries and that sort of thing, if that's all right with everyone. Um, so I wanted to start, um, and maybe we can start on this end, and let's talk about the comics that you were each exposed to in your youth, mm -hmm. um, what kind of comics were around, and what did teachers, parents, or other adults feel about your comics reading when you were growing up? Oh, yes. Well, Argentina is it's a strange country, but all countries here are strange, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, it has a huge uh, comic culture, but it's, it's, every, everybody struggled in the comics culture forever. <laughs> like, in the 50s it was very big, in the 30s it was, it was kind of big, but then every, every cartoonist has to kind of struggle to, to make a living in comics. Uh, the only guys who could more or less get like a safe pass are the guys that are in the newspapers, because then in the newspaper the people who don't read comics read comics. So you know those guys kind of made a name for themselves. And the most famous in Argentina is one guy called Kino. So 
maybe some of you Italians they know, the French they know, called the, he did a comic called Mafalda. And Mafalda was this kind of like a Charlie Brown peanuts type story with a little bunch of kids, but the difference was that they were like highly political. <laughs> they would protest, you know, the war in Vietnam and my father would have the Beatles and uh, so that's what you grew up reading and which is great like you know I, I love uh, children's literature but people generally give it like also like a free pass to children's literature like oh yeah, they're all good yeah some books for kids suck some are amazing <laughs> The cool thing about Mafalda was it was not a, a comic that would teach you to, you know, behave or do this or do that, but it was a comic that taught me that to question everything. So Mafalda was constantly questioning the world of grown-ups, she was questioning the, the political world. So that was one that I, was, I used to read. The other one that I called my own when I was a little kid was called The Eternaut, that had just been published by Fantagraphics, like a big chunk of uh, science fiction, and it's this amazing, like graphic novel of uh, science fiction, like 300 pages of this invasion in, in Buenos Aires. So for me, that I used to watch like George Lucas and Spielberg. Suddenly, something happening in Buenos Aires was hey, <laughs> it was fun. So th that was kind of what I read. And then the other thing is my my father. My father was born in England. He was born the last day of the Second World War, like 1945, 15th of August. Came out in the newspaper as a peace baby. <laughs> so, so he he was very much uh, he very much wanted me to learn English, and my English is more or less because he uh, he would buy me like Mad Magazine, and he would buy me Calvin and Hobbes, like whatever I would like to read in Spanish, I had to buy with my allowance. But whatever I would buy in English, he would buy for me, and him knowing I was a cheap little man. <laughs> so it was Stephen King and Mad Magazine. So your parents were generally supportive of you as a comics reader as a kid. Yeah, yeah so it's was their fault. Because okay. then <laughs> when I started, you know, I started studying law, and they were all happy, happy. But if you give kids, you know, just to Stephen King and Mad, yeah, that's not get you a lawyer. <laughs> so yeah, eventually they had to come to terms with this horrible truth. Hi. I grew up in Montreal, uh, French Canada, and I'm a French speaker. And um, my father grew up with comic books like Tintin and uh, Spirou, and um, and he really loved them. So he bought lots of them. And at home when I was a kid, I grew up. My parents has a they had a big wall full of books, and a huge part of that wall was filled with comic books, which bande dessinée in French. And uh, among them, we had Mafalda, like we had uh, Tintin, Asterix, uh, Spirou, uh, Gaston Lagaffe, uh, and Le Chat de Philippe Guéluc. And we had so many, because my father liked them, and it, it had helped him love reading as a kid. So he loved comic books, and he shared that with us. So he, they, my parents never, ever criticized us reading comic books. It was. Um, something we could do together, and we would uh, we would always get some for Christmas, and my father would like steal them from us and read them too. So um, I never had any uh, idea that some people consider comic books to be sub literature or um, less good form of literature. Uh, on the contrary, I was raised thinking that uh, combining pictures and uh, words was cool and was was a great way to learn how to think, how to read, and um, I remember that I read a lot of Archie comics too. I, I had tons of them, which didn't come from my father because it wasn't his generation. And some of my friends, their parents were preventing them to read Archie books because they had mistakes in them and they thought it was cheap literature. And my parents were like, I don't get that. <laughs> we were, every summer we were, when we were, before we went on vacation, my, my dad gave me a big cargo board box and we would go to used books, uh, used bookstores and we could fill it with anything we wanted. So it was usually filled with Archie books and all kinds of um, graphic novels. So um, I kind of grew up uh, thinking in terms of pictures and words. So when I started writing, it came naturally to me that like pictures had to go with it, and I always loved drawing too, and that's how I learned how to draw by copying the different characters that they saw in all those uh, 
those comic books. And I also, I was a big fan of Mafalda, and it also taught me how to think for myself. Um, so I think it's an awesome form of um, education, of reading, and I'm always surprised when um, I meet teachers or parents in different markets who think that it's they're scared that kids won't read enough if they only read that, or that it's not uh, high quality reading. So I'm starting to learn why they think that way and trying to convince them that it can be, you can learn a lot through reading comics. Um, and you can learn to love reading, to love reading other things too, if you read, if you start reading comics. Are you ready? <laughs> Moi, je, je, je pense que je, je suis arrivée à la, à, la, à la bande dessinée petite parce que mon frère m'interdisait de lui euh, prendre ses bandes dessinées, en fait. Mon grand frère. Oui. I, I started reading uh, bande dessinée, so comics, uh, because I would steal my brother's books. Um, quand on était en Afrique, um, um, les garçons avaient droit à des, à des bandes dessinées. Uh, et les filles, bah, Enfin, c'était plutôt les garçons, c'était plutôt les frères qui disaient que c'était pas, c'était pas pour les filles. So when I was growing up in Africa, uh, boys had the right to read comics, and they were telling the girls that no, girls, you don't have the right to read comics. Et uh, donc uh, lorsqu'il euh, il, il partait, euh, il n'était pas là, je lui piquais ses bandes dessinées. So as soon as he would leave, he would go somewhere, I would uh, steal his comics. Que mon rêve c'est d'être un garçon quand j'étais petite. Et, euh, Because my dream was to be a boy. Comme lui, comme mon frère. Euh, like him. Et, euh, et donc c'est grâce, grâce à lui que j'ai pu euh, lire Raon. À l'époque c'était ça, c'était Raon, Zangla, Black Le Rock. Oui, oh, <rire> So thanks to him I started reading Raon. C'est des séries françaises. Euh, non, c'est euh, américain Raon. Non, c'est français, pardon. Oui, français. So, French, classical, Mais, French comics. Zambla, c'est... Euh... Zambla, Rhin. Mm. Oui. Euh, et, euh, et quelques comics. Euh, super-héros. Super et some, some super-hero comics. Donc, euh, moi, j'étais je, je, voilà, je, juste pour embêter mon frère à l'époque et, et, <rire> et pouvoir découvrir dans... I, I didn't mean it to annoy my brother, but I also wanted to discover the world of comics. C'est comme ça que j'ai voilà, commencé à à lire des BD, sinon c'était pas, pas dans mon univers. So that's how I started, otherwise it was really out of my reach. And now me. <laughs> uh, well, I, I grew up until I was six, seven. I was behind the Iron Curtain, so in Eastern Europe, so there were absolutely no comics. I mean, I guess there were some, but there, it was more in newspaper, newspaper strips in Bulgaria. And then as soon as the, the, the wall fell, We had Garfield and the Disney magazine, the one that the Italians were making in Italy, that we thought it was American, but it's actually Italian, and it still exists, and it's very, very healthy. Um, and so that's all. I read just Disney and, and uh, Garfield. And then I just started reading when I started doing my job four years ago in Brussels. That's where I really discovered European bon in in all its glory, basically. So that's all. Okay. I grew up with Disney comics because uh, uh, in Italy we have a very long tradition of Disney comics. 80% uh, of uh, Disney comics is uh, being made uh, in, uh, in Milan and in the rest of Italy and then is exported elsewhere. And uh, I am the daughter of a teacher who is very, very strict. So my mother didn't see this uh, as something really uh, good, but uh, she had a, a, a small um, brother who was uh, the, the crazy one in the family and this brother kept uh, in a wardrobe uh, a wardrobe which was full, completely full of comics uh, partly where uh, Disney comics and partly where Alan Ford, which is another um, Italian com comic of the time so I wasn't really interested in Alan Ford with the uh, guns and things like that but uh, I was interested in Disney comics and somebody tells me that uh, I started reading at three but I remember that I, I I drew my own comics, and as I wasn't able yet to, to, to write exactly the, the words, I asked my grandmother to put the words in the volumes. So I think I, it was my, my young uncle, uh, uncle's fault. Uh, so everyone had comics as kids, uh, eventually. 
and it looks like there was a lot of influence from American comics. Um, I want to unpack a couple of uh, maybe prejudices that Anglo North America has about international comics and sort of float them by you and see if they ring true for you in your experience. So uh, one thing that we, we tell ourselves here in sort of our, our um, Comics 101 talks is that there are three grand traditions of world comics, and those are Japanese, American, and Franco-Belgian. Um, and so, does that sound true to you? Do you feel like you are part of, as cartoonists and as writers, do you feel that you're part of one of those traditions, or does that sound like a completely false trichotomy? Uh, yeah, they are like those three, and uh, definitely in, in Latin America the influence is the, the first way comics got to Latin America was through newspapers. So what Argentinian uh, cartoonists at the beginning of the 20th century would do is they would just, <laughs> you know, they, they really didn't know about their, their rights. So <laughs> we would copy the, 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 the there were the, you know, little Nemo in Slumberlands, there was this thing called Los Sueños de Tomasito, The Dreams of Tomasito, which was the crappiest version you could ever imagine of a masterpiece. So the, the way Argentina got into comics was a very American door, which is through the daily strip. And then, uh, like uh, in the 1930s and 40s, there was a very kind of direct relationship with Argentina and United States. I mean, Disney used to come to Argentina, and, and he was friends with some cartoonists back there. So that influence was very big. When I was growing up, also the, the French, uh, the Franco-Belgian uh, strip that the magazines that I would read would be Asterix, uh, Tintin, and uh, Lucky Luke, or Lucky Luck. We, we say Lucky Luke. So, so I think those two were probably my main influences, and then Mad Magazine, like I said, like the whole kind of, you know, uh, very anarchic thing that I was providing it was very good for me. But, so, uh, me growing up, the Japanese uh, was not that much there. But what we did in Influx uh, Comics in Argentina was a lot of uh, social and political stuff that would not come in the American version. So, like I was saying, Mafalda, or El Eternauta even had this kind of like other like political social uh, views that were in between these comics for kids, like kind of in the mix, uh, because the, the 60s and 70s in Argentina was a huge political turmoil, so it was impossible not to talk uh, at least in a, in a like, you know, subtle way, because you would get, you know, murdered by the dictatorship if you, they kind of disagree with you. My, my publisher in Argentina, Daniel Divinsky, who's the publisher of Kinos and Mafaldas, published a book for kids in the 70s of, like, it was, it would teach kids how to count, you know, so it was like, I went back, so it was like, one, two, three, four, and the last page was a, like a red fist. And he got like seven months of prison because he was like indoctrinating little five-year-old terrorists or something. So it was hard for that, but but then politics were very much in the mix. And I think European also had like a lot of politics, but that's how it got to me. Um, I'm really not an expert on those uh, those topics, and uh, in fact, I've only started being described as a cartoonist recently. Uh, I mostly uh, thought I was doing uh, picture books because uh, I was not doing panels, so my, my books come with like, pictures and words, but they're picture books. Um, in Quebec, I started being described as a cartoonist, and I, I'm always confused with those uh, uh, labels. Um, so I don't know much about how people perceive different forms of different cultures um, of like bande dessinée or, or comic books. So um, I think this guy's who you have to listen to. Uh, in my case, the only thing I can say is I, I grew up specifically with the French and Belgian uh, culture. Um, almost everything I read except from uh, Mafalda came from, uh, from France or Belgium. And um, I discovered much later um, the work of uh, like, uh, 
uh, American cartoonists, and um, and uh, I never discovered mangas, not yet. <laughs> I still have to discover that. So um, I don't have much to say about the, the uh, classifications, or um, and I'm still very confused about how and why everybody needs to put everything in some boxes. For me, they're just books um, with more or less pictures, uh, more or less jokes, more or less humor, more or less political spirit or superheroes, and they're, they're books, and um, I'm still honored to be called a cartoonist. So. <laughs> Moi, je suis un peu comme, comme toi. Euh, le manga, je l'ai découvert avec mon fils il n'y a pas longtemps. I'm, I'm a bit like you, and I've discovered manga recently with, uh, through my son. Et, euh, en fait, moi, j'ai commencé la BD euh, avec, euh, avec le roman graphique. I started working. I, I discovered uh, comics through the graphic novel. Et, euh, et d'ailleurs, on, on, on me classe dans cette, enfin, dans cette catégorie-là. And I've been classified in this category. Parce que euh, on donne la part dans, dans le roman graphique, on laisse la, la, la part belle aux histoires, aux grandes histoires. Because in the European graphic novels, the, the story has a very very important role. Et, euh, et comme je, je raconte de longues histoires, parce que dans mes dans mes dans mes romans, il y a euh, il y a beaucoup de personnages. And since I tell very very long and complicated stories with many characters. Oui. Donc euh, pour moi c'est tout à fait normal d'aller dans ce dans ce sens là. Donc euh, je, euh, je suis assez contente de faire partie d'une catégorie même si j'aime pas trop ça. Mais I'm happy to be part of this category although I don't like labeling either. Mais euh, ce que j'aime avant tout moi c'est raconter des histoires. Donc peu m'importe le support. What matters for me to, is to tell stories. I don't really care about the medium. Et euh, je suis euh, je, je... Euh, je fais de la bande dessinée, enfin, du roman graphique, comme je fais des séries télé, comme je fais des films pour le cinéma. I do graphic novels, just like I do uh, animated series, just like I do cinema. Et, euh, et encore une fois, c'est ça, c'est créer des personnages, de trouver des motivations euh, qui les feront agir de telle ou telle manière. Et, euh, et, euh, et donc, euh, bon, je... je Voilà, the bottom line is the important is to tell a story, to, to create uh, beautiful characters and to tell their story. No, I don't have anything to say. Okay, for me it's uh, more or less like uh, uh, the two girls because uh, um, I've never been interested in uh, um, novels as well. I, I grew up with Disney comics because they were next to me, but uh, I was also a very voracious reader of everything, from the shampoo uh, thing <laughs> in, the, in the bathroom to anything I found uh, at home. And for me too, the, my, need, my strongest need was to uh, grow up and, uh, and tell stories. Uh, so it happened with comics, uh, and now I'm very, very happy because when uh, uh, I, with comics I feel at home. And uh, I've been so lucky to have found, uh, I, I cannot draw, so I've been so lucky to have found uh, an artist who can draw for me, so I married him, so it's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, now we are doing most of, most of our stuff together, which is easier, it's fantastic, because uh, each time it's, uh, we, we enter a new story, it's like a new uh, voyage, uh, which sometimes lasts for two or three years when it's graphic novels. And uh, I feel very happy here in this world of, uh, of comics, but it happened. So uh, now I feel this is my, my, my home, but I've never been a um, freak about uh, uh, waves of comics. Uh, yeah. So um, the other prejudice, perhaps, of Anglo-North Americans that I want to unpack here is that when we look to other comics cultures, we think, oh, there's such a more mature publishing industry for comics, or uh, comics get more respect in Europe or wherever. Um, we, like, that's a thing we tell ourselves. Um, and so, uh, maybe starting with Teresa, uh, is that true when you interact with people now as a creator? Um, do you find there's a difference between the reception you get uh, with your sort of Anglo North American public, or your public in Italy, or your public in France, or any of you, wherever your, your publics are. 
Uh, actually, this is our first time here in the US and we've uh, not yet been published in English. Mm -hmm. uh, our first book will come out next year. <laughs> and, um, and what have people had to say to you here then? Uh, but I, I don't find any great difference. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the public is the, more or less the same everywhere in the means that uh, uh, there are people who are really interested in stories mm -hmm. and uh, they don't care if you are uh, European or from the US or from wherever. They are interested in your characters and in the emotions that they convey. And this is the same everywhere. The, mm -hmm. the, uh, the greatest gift that we have uh, uh, by traveling around, uh, by our stories traveling around, is uh, that we meet readers. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, that's fantastic because uh, we can see that stories have really no barriers and that uh, emotions are the same uh, everywhere. And uh, we've got readers in France uh, who were uh, uh, very, very big and apparently rude men who came there uh, to, have, um, to have a sketch and they told us, okay, I read your book and I cried. And uh, I think this is fantastic. Uh, just, uh, um, just when a kid comes and says, uh, because we do both uh, books for uh, grown-ups and for kids, and uh, when a kid comes and he says, oh, I love this character, and, uh, and it happens both in France and in Italy, and uh, uh, I hope it will uh, happen in the US as well. So this is the, the, the main thing, that stories uh, um, uh, cancel barriers, really, in the world. Moi, j'ai beaucoup de chance. Euh, enfin, les Américains m'aiment beaucoup, en tout cas les lecteurs américains. I'm very lucky because it seems that American, the American audience loves me a lot. <laughs> Parce qu'ils disent que bah, euh, des histoires euh, comme Aya, comme Akissi, il bah, n'y en a pas énormément ici, il n'y en a même pas. Because they say that stories like uh, Aya and Akissi, there, there aren't many here in the US, mm -hmm. such type of stories. Ils bah, essayent de raconter une Afrique euh, urbaine, moderne, Euh, autre que, que, que celle qu'on montre dans les médias, je pense que c'est quelque chose qu'ils ne, qu ne connaissent même pas. Because it seems that they don't know uh, the, Af the modern urban Africa that, that, that I speak about. It seems that they don't know it because the only thing that they know uh, is that uh, the Africa that the media presents. Mm -hmm. for... Donc j'ai beaucoup de vraiment j'ai beaucoup de, de, de remerciements. Euh, les gens sont curieux et ça c'est très important pour moi. C'est euh, Je, je, je me dis que bah, les Américains, bah, ils sont curieux parce qu'ils sont demandés. Et, euh, and I, I, I meet very many grateful people and, and uh, many curious people who would like to know more, and uh, I find it's great. Enfin, de toute façon, même en Europe, j'ai eu, euh, eu aussi quelques, quelques, quelques retours euh, des, des, des gens qui m'ont demandé si on avait vraiment des voitures en Afrique. Donc, euh, but, <laughs> and even in Europe, I have had fans who have asked me, are there really cars in Africa? Donc, là, j'ai, depuis que je suis ici, on m'a pas encore demandé ça. Donc, I still haven't had this question here, so... Non. I do understand your question. And I have felt this too, by looking, by reading a lot about, because we are, uh, well, our job is a bit on a crossroad. We are we, we're supposed to know the European market and we're supposed to know a lot about the American market in order to present to Americans what they would like from our European catalogs. So I do uh, meet this uh, this idea. I speak to American publishers and they are all very thrilled. And, and I, I do perceive what you're saying, that there is this opinion that the Franco-Belgian, or the, let's say the European, let's generalize a bit, the European tradition is very profound and it's very rich and it's very diverse whereas the American is very rich and diverse, but only in the superhero uh, area, and not yet in the true graphic novel. Uh, and I think that's why uh, more and more publishers are interested in acquiring and licensing European comics, because they're trying to get the missing content. But at the same time, I think that locally, you are also producing more and more of that type of content, either because you're influenced from the Europeans, or just because that's the creativity wave now that's um, so yeah but the categorization I think it is useful to say okay manga European American uh, it is useful in everyday conversation it's a convention but uh, I, I guess whoever is an expert or, an, uh, or a reader and goes deep inside it is but the bottom line is it's all about good stories so I think they're merging a lot these categories in, in the end and you can find a bit of everything in each some deeper and more shallow 
Um, from my experience, um, the, the American uh, people are extremely respectful and uh, excited about the growing comics industry and graphic novel industry, but the, the, the editors and publishers aren't. Well, they, they might be. I think they're fascinated by it, but they're very scared that it won't sell. Maybe, I don't know, if it costs more to produce because it's like full color books, and they think that it's still a very dangerous market. That's what I heard. Because when I started um, trying to um, explore the American market, I met many, many different uh, publishers, and I wanted to do a real graphic novel with panels. That's what I had in mind. I had my character, and I was showing it to them, and they were all saying the same thing to me. What we want is for you to do a novel with doodles in it, like Diary of a Wimpy Kid, because that's what sells. They really didn't want me to do panels, because they were like, eee, we're very lucky, we can sell. When it works, we'll sell millions, but when it doesn't, it costs a lot, and we can't, just, we can't afford it. So, um, and your French language uh, publishers weren't saying that to you? Oh no, in French, no. I never had any problem, and like, people want comic books in French. Uh, but here they were, they, they really acted scared, and I think one, maybe, maybe one of the reasons why this is happening is because in French, uh, Canada and France too, um, publishers are subsidized, um, so they don't depend entirely on the sales to get their money back. Whether here, like, uh, publishers, they really have to sell a lot to cover their costs, so it makes it more like money related, which I find really hard, because I would like to just like do whatever I want, of course, and I would like them to publish whatever I want and say, this is wonderful, we'll publish it. So it doesn't happen. So I would say that everybody wants to buy books and the people want the books. The, the editors are scared that they're going to lose money if they publish them. Um, so I'm not sure about the respect. I, I'm sure that it's easier for me to publish um, a graphic novel or comic book in the French market. And ha so has that shaped some of the content that you've produced? Well, of course. Well, I had to do this book that had, like, instead of panels, that was a novel. Because they were telling me also that the schools don't buy comics, parents don't buy comics, because they're scared that it's not good liter literature. But if I draw, like, if I write a novel with some comics in it, then the teachers think that the kids are, read are, are reading for real, because there are, like, blocks of text, so that's more serious. So they wanted me to do that, and um, I had to. So I constantly have to fight back and try to get them to do, and also I have to fight back to do more political stuff too, mm -hmm. and to do jokes that are not necessarily appropriate, uh, age appropriate for their market, because they're always very scared of what the, the buyers are going to think. So it's very, very different, and I'm not sure, Like I don't think it's a matter of um, respect. I think they would like to be able to do that, but they don't know if they can survive doing that yet. So they're, the ones who are trying, they, they're taking a big risk. So I understand why, where they come from, and I'm just trying to understand the market better here, because it's very, very different from where I grew up. Yeah, Latin America is, uh, the situation is more dire <laughs> than, than, I guess, Canada or Europe. Uh, they still, people uh, conceive comics <clears throat> as a just for kids, that generally what you get is, oh, those are just for kids. The, the one problem we have is what we call comics. It's like comics here, you know, the, the name comics to a lot of people is, ah, they're oh, the funnies, oh, they're funnies. And then you buy mouse, and it's not that funny, <laughs> you know, because it's, because the, the name sometimes has the thing attached to it. So in, in, in Latin America, they're called historietas which is like little stories, like storiettes, or in, in Brazil they're called quadrinhos, which is little squares, you know, and everything's little for some reason, uh, fumetti, yeah? <laughs> so everything is kind of tiny, and how can you, you know, how can you use something with the word tiny or comic to tell the Holocaust, or, yeah. or you know, just a big, big human story, you shouldn't do that, yeah. and, and I think the history of comics have, have also in the United States, have been attached to that like stigma, you know. And uh, I think in in all our different countries, that's that world's been coming down. Like in the sixties, in here with the underground comic, and then like the whole mouse thing. I think mouse was a big kind of changing point. Yeah. Uh, in Europe, with the whole you know Moebius, you know that and those guys, and then. 
In Latin America, that still has not happened. We, we're trying. But what blew my mind was when, when I started publishing here in the United States with two books, the first time I talked with Francoise Mouly, my, my publisher, she told me, well, the thing is, uh, here in America, we are not doing uh, graphic novels for kids. And I'm like, that's why I started two books. And that was so, you know, what? Like, I'm still trying to convince everyone in Argentina that they're, but I haven't thought about it, but when the graphic novel took over over the last 20 or 30 years, it was such a big wave of, oh, now we can finally, you know, they we're treated like grown-ups. Right, comics are not just for kids. Yeah, anymore. nobody it's tells, right? yeah, nobody tells John Cassavetes, you know, no, you do superheroes, you know, just, it's like thinking that movies would only be like Chuck Norris films, mm -hmm. you know. But in, in, in comics, after, you know, for different reasons, for a long time, uh, it was like that, and superheroes and stories for little boys, generally. And uh, when that fell, of course, the whole collective of artists went like, oh, finally, you know, we can tell our grown-ups like, our ideas. And I think, yeah, probably through, through a little amount of time, like, the graphic novel for kids was not happening. Right. It was more like the graphic novel for adults. And now you're, start, you're starting to see all these amazing graphic novels for kids that but that's like maybe the last 10 years or something like that, that they really came back to. But I think we kind of, there's, in Latin America, there's, there's certainly still this concept that it's just for kids, you know, my father won't be caught dead reading a comic, and his partner from the, you know, law firm enters and he's reading, you know, even like the most, you know, Daniel Klaus. Right. <laughs> you know? But I try, I, I convince him eventually. I think Mark has a good Il y a 30 ans, en France, on disait à un enfant, pose ta BD, prends un livre. 30 years ago, in France as well, you would tell a kid, uh, drop the uh, comics, uh, read a proper book. Aujourd'hui, on dit, pose ta, 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 ta tablette graphique et prends une BD. And nowadays, they say, leave the tablet, the, the iPad, uh, on the side and take your comic book. Et, uh, <laughs> et même dans les, dans les, dans les écoles, euh, euh, yeah, dans la liste des, des livres à lire, on, on, in class, there yeah, are BD. And nowadays, even in school, in the list, I think it's called obligatory reading, there are comics. And now teachers actually see it as a tool to help reading. And now teachers actually see it as a tool to help reading. Et euh, oui, c'est vraiment rentré aujourd'hui. Euh, bah, le discours des prescripteurs, prescripteurs a bien changé et ça tombe mieux. And I must speak to parents often, and, they, and, and it is well accepted, and the prejudice doesn't really exist anymore, at least in her opinion. And uh, it has changed its role, and it's part of education now. Uh, I wanted to circle back to something that has a little bit to do with what Elise was talking about and also what you were saying, Marguerite, about um, the way the market is shaping the content of your work. And especially Marguerite uh, was saying that um, the effect of Aya and Akisi, one effect has been that it combats a representation of Africa that uh, we see that it is negative in the media. Is that part of, was that part of your thinking in creating those works? Was, uh, is, or I guess a better way of putting that is, were you thinking of an international public, or who, who were you writing for? And what borders did you think it would cross when you were creating it? Alors, euh, alors Aya, enfin, moi je suis pas du tout, euh, c'est pas mon univers, euh, l'écriture, euh, l'écriture c'est pas une passion. <laughs> Writing is not really my universe, it's not really my passion. It's plutôt même compliqué, c'est très, c'est, c'est, c'est très solitaire, écrire. Moi, je, je, je viens d'un pays où prendre un livre et se mettre même à lire à côté, c'est pas normal. It's a very solitary job, writing, it's not really for me. And I come from a world where if you take your book and you go into a corner and you read, people will look at you badly. Non, et, et, et par contre, on nous a appris à raconter des histoires. But they did teach us to tell stories. On avait, on avait, moi j'avais un grand-père 
qui, euh, qui pendant les deux mois de vacances, euh, ils nous, ils nous, euh, euh, nos parents nous envoyaient au village et pendant deux mois, et bah, euh, euh, on vivait avec les grands-parents. And I had a grandfather who would go to our grandparents in the summer for the summer holidays. And our grandfather. Et mon grand-père euh, nous réunissait autour du feu. Ça fait très cliché. À l'époque, il n'y avait pas d'électricité, pas d'eau courante. Et, euh, et nous, les citadins qu'on était, on, 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 c'était pas possible. Mais euh, notre grand-père nous réunissait et c'était lui notre télé. Mm -hmm. Il nous racontait des histoires. So in the evening, we would gather around the fire. So back in those days, there was no electricity. There was no TV, so our grandfather was our TV. He would get all the children around him and he would tell us stories. Et quand je suis arrivée en France à l'âge de 12 ans, euh, je, je, il fallait pour moi, c'était important que je raconte à, à ces nouveaux euh, 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 amis d'où je venais. And when I arrived in France, when I was 12, I felt the need to tell my new friends, the French, where I came from. Euh, parce qu'ils avaient beaucoup de préjugés, et ça c'est des petits, et c'est pour ça. C'est peut-être pour ça que je fais des livres euh, jeunesse, parce que dès petit, moi je me souviens, ils me touchaient la peau, ils me disaient, pour moi c'était du chocolat. chocolat. Et je me suis dit qu'il fallait justement raconter bah, l'ailleurs, bah, euh, partager, moi, euh, mais euh, oui, bah, d'où je venais, leur dire que bah, chez nous, bah, on a aussi des, euh, on a beaucoup de préjugés aussi. And I felt the need to tell the story, to tell them a, a story about a, a, a different place, a di something different from where they came from. And by the way, there was a lot of prejudice also where I came from. Mais, mais juste parce que moi aussi, je les touché pour ça. Moi Because me too, I would touch them and taste their skin. <laughs> ça c'était... Euh, mais bon, euh, donc tout ça pour dire que... Euh, euh, oui, je pense que euh, c'est pas pour rien que, que je fais des, des, des histoires qui se passent euh, en Afrique. Euh, parce que justement, euh, c'était un parti pris. Je voulais raconter comment vivent les Africains et pas comment ils meurent. <laughs> so, uh, yes, as you say, I was thinking of my audience in that sense that I wanted to tell them a story, the story of how Africans live and not of how they die. Uh, Teresa, I, I saw you on a panel yesterday and I think that you were talking about and, uh, that um, globetrotting viola and how it represented a world uh, that you wanted your daughter to know she was in. Um, can you talk a bit about the way in which that work uh, looks across borders. Yes, uh, I was thinking when, when she was talking that uh, it was a different motivation, but I think uh, in some ways it resembles a uh, motivation. Um, usually when we work on a, a new book, or we work on a story that we strongly feel the need to tell. Mm -hmm. So we don't ask ourselves, uh, who is the real audience? Uh, who is going to buy this? Uh, who, uh, what will they say? It's just a strong need because uh, when we work on a new book, this means that uh, we will be in that journey for one, two, uh, two years and a half. So it's going to uh, be part of our life and we part of the book for such a long journey. And uh, it has to be really something that interests us and that uh, is burning inside. So when we decided to, to, to tell that story of Viola who is traveling around, uh, we were in that uh, we, we were watching TV and listening to the news, and all the time everybody said, uh, "Okay, this is a, such a difficult uh, period. Everything is uh, wrong, uh, and there is crisis here, crisis there. It's better not to uh, to have new children now because uh, what do you do? Why do you do? Why do you have children to put them in this kind of world?" And we were. Uh, moved by, uh, pushed by the, the other di direction. Uh, um, we had a small girl, I was expecting the second one, and uh, uh, we told ourselves, why? Let's uh, um, tell a story for kids who are coming in this world uh, and tell them, okay, uh, you can also see the, the, the glass which is half full. There are so many things that are beautiful if you uh, 
put on the right glasses, I said, you, you just have to, to look for things, and if you yourself are open to differences, which is the main thing that is beautiful in our world, if you are open to others who are different from you, you can get a lot of presents and leave a lot of uh, pieces of you to them, which are presents for them. See, it, life is an exchange, and so if we are closed into our careers, we won't find anything beautiful. Uh, it's uh, because we are all different that we are all the same. I think that's what we the, that's what pushed us to do, to do things for uh, uh, young people. Uh, Linear, you also write about your children. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit about the impetus for that? Yes, uh, I, I have a daily strip that I've been doing in Argentina for 15 years. Mm -hmm. And in the daily strip is kind of a schizophrenic strip, I guess, because well, when I started doing it, I, like, I loved Calvin and Hobbes, so I wanted a little bit of that. I loved the far side, and that, more fun. So I stole from everyone. Like, I was in Argentina, who was going to find that? Even, and then I started drawing myself in the strip as a rabbit, like with little bunny ears. And I remember doing my first of those comics and then going like, oh no, Matt Green. He, he does life in hell, and sometimes he draws himself into life in hell, and he's a rabbit. Uh, and then, me being in Buenos Aires, I went like, fuck my Green. <laughs> He'll never, ever find out. There's no way. <laughs> Mark Green, he must be like in a mansion somewhere. I don't know. So I started doing myself as a rabbit, and then my <laughs> sister calls me on the phone one time. Turns out Mark Green is dating her friend in Argentina, now they're married. So Margarine married, married my sister's friend. So basically I had to come out to Matt. I call him Matt. <laughs> but again, Matt. <laughs> funny. But since I was doing myself in the strip, then I had my kids, you know, while I was doing the strip. And you, I, you kind of want to share some of that with your audience, because, you know, I like my audience. So, you know, I would every now if they do if they did something that was really strange or that like at one time they called me on the phone, you know, those people that want to sell you something for their you know telephone, whatever. And I, they asked for the person who was in charge of these things in the house. So I gave my telephone to Matilda who was one year and a half. And they talked for a long time. Just because Matilda would go like that. And the guy was like, Mara, are you the excellent thing for the, your phone and you can call abroad? And it was a long, long call. <laughs> and then Matilda was like, eh, and the woman got, got really angry and she called back, right? You know, they could do that. Yeah. And so I had to draw that into the cartoon. I asked permission to her mother and was like, please, please, can you do that? But generally, I try not to draw them. But then, there's this other thing that happens when you're a father is, or a parent, you guys who have kids must know, is you are looking all the time where is the pause button. Like, wh what do I press for them to not grow anymore and stay perfect like they are right now? Like, oh, this, they are so funny and crazy. You're living with this, like, you know, like Chaplin and Buñuel and, you know, like geniuses of comedy and surrealism in your house. And you don't want them to grow up, but, uh, you, know, like, you can't do that, but if you put them in a book, then that day you can keep. So that's how my brain worked. And then I thought, oh, but maybe I shouldn't use their real names, because, you know... Uh, and I went back and forth with that, and then I read that, uh, you know, in the Winnie the Pooh books, you know, uh, uh, Christopher, Christopher Robin, was the actual design of A.A. Uh, Milne and all the toys were their toys and, and I was like, okay, so it worked for A.A. For Milne for they made like Disney money, let's do this and then I read that Christopher Robin Milne hated his father for doing that so that may happen but I, I, I just did one with my first two daughters and then I did one with my other daughter I think that's it for, books with my daughters, but, so, yeah, they are also very expensive mm. kids. You need to you know, <laughs> cash in at some point. So those are the two tune books that you have. You have a third tune yeah. book on the way, right? I, the, those are two tune books? No, there's a third one that's already done, that's uh, written and drawn by Henrietta, which is one of the characters from my daily strip. I used that for a story about 
a little girl writing a com like a comic for her. So it was a lot of fun for me to draw like a little girl, just because I am a little girl somewhere in here. So I had to connect with that, which was really nice. And then uh, when you know how to draw, and these you know people here, except for you, but your drawings are very interesting. <laughs> They you know how to draw, when you have to draw like a little kid, it's a lot of fun because you have to trick your own mind into drawing like a kid, which is fun. So we'll try that. So, uh, is everyone here familiar with the Toon Books line? Do we know what? Yes? Okay. Are people not familiar, I guess is a better question. <laughs> so, Toon Books is a, is a line of books uh, published by Françoise Mouly, who is the, also the art editor of The New Yorker. Um, and she has a wonderful art Rolodex and, and is making these beautiful books that are first readers. Uh, so very early reader graphic novels, um, and uh, I wanted to just sort of make sure we all knew what that was because I want to ask, and, and at least you have a tune book as well, um, is that format of this first reader graphic novel presented in a hardcover, um, is that something that you had ever encountered before, worked with before, uh, Linears? And then my follow-up is, your tune book was shrunk from an album size. I, I want to know about the format of those Toon books and how that feels and, and how it was to work in them. Yeah, no, the, the three books I did for Toon, I did with Toon in my yeah, head, yeah. so I didn't sh shrink. I, uh, but, yeah, it was, for me, like I was saying before, it was kind of a surprise, this concept that the graphic novel for kids was not happening or was not happening as much. Of course, there's always Superman and Batman and whatever, Lego, whatever corporation is putting out books, but there was not this thing that all these amazing artists were doing for grown-ups, nobody was kind of doing that for kids. And kids would read a thousand pages of Harry Potter. If they'll read a hundred, a thousand pages of Harry they can read two hundred pages or three hundred pages of comics. Yeah, even more so if it's well done. And, uh, but Francois went even to younger, to just first, uh, he always kind of explains it as a gateway drug to reading. Which is very cool for kids, yeah, yeah, yeah drugs for kids. <laughs> I don't know about that concept, but uh, it is the the when I started reading with, as I said, Mafalda and Tintin, and there's this this exercise you do with your brain in reading comics, which is really amazing. Which is moving the character from one panel to the next one. You are doing this the motion between the panels. You don't do that when you see Pixar. You do it when you see a comic. You, kind of feeling the blinds that they're moving and like flowing. And I remember th that is a learned thing, that, that you have to learn to do it in order to enjoy reading that. I remember giving to my, my father-in-law, who, who was so excited that his daughter was buying a cartoonist. <laughs> I, so I wanted to connect with this guy. So I, he was very much into Second World War, so I gave him mouse to read. And uh, you're gonna enjoy this book because it's amazing and it's about the Second World War. And then he was, he was like 70 something. And then he, when, when it, next week I asked, What? Well, did you read the book? He was like, oh, You know what? I don't know how long I have to look at the drawings. <laughs> and of course, he did not, you know, develop these things that you have to do with your brain in order to understand how to read comics. So, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> what was the conversation like about? Uh, taking the great Antonio and shrinking it into tune size. Was that just not a big deal, or how do you feel? Um, I was surprised, but uh, yes, as uh, he's saying, uh, the great Antonio book is really a, a big picture book uh, with lots of space and lots of white, and that's how I wanted it to be because it's the story of a really large guy in Montreal who's pulled buses with his hair. So um, um, I wanted to give him a lot of space and uh, and I did write the book with uh, some uh, speech balloons, but that's about the only thing that would um, have like uh, someone classify it as a graphic novel. Um, it really is a picture book, but uh, sometimes a character will say something. And I also like to add um, hand-drawn lettering um, because I find it uh, graphically nice. So, um, so it's my uh, my publisher, La Pastec. Uh, from Montreal, who uh, sold the uh, rights to Toon Books, and uh, I was surprised too because I didn't see it as a as a comic book or a graphic novel. Um, but I was really happy because I really admire what Francois is doing here, and um, 
and I was also very surprised by how they shrunk the book to make it like maybe like this size, a little bit taller than this, and from a very big picture book. So Antonio was like totally like locked inside this box, and his arms are going out of the pages. We don't see these this big muscles as, as much. So um, it was surprising, but I can I guess I can tell why she saw it as a um, as a graphic novel because of the speech volumes, because of the use of uh, visual lettering, hand lettering, and uh, the way maybe I tell stories might be influenced by uh, comic books too. So um, that's probably why she decided to do that, and she had to make it fit into her collection. Right. So uh, I think that's what happened. Uh, Nazali, we were talking yesterday about format issues, and, and I think you've heard some feedback from. North Americans about European formats and French language formats. Do you want to tell us all about it? Uh, well, <laughs> basically, yeah, the context is that uh, we're, we're selling rights to um, or the French publishers, we're selling rights to American publishers, and very often, I think most of the time, they change the format and they shrink them a bit because they need to fit in the bookshelves, in bookshops, because otherwise they will be put aside from what I understood. Because I actually continue the conversation afterwards right. with a publisher. Um, but then uh, the other day we had this uh, graphic novel forum with librarians. There was this talk back session, and a few librarians asked us why, you know, we were all French publishers, so they asked us why do American publishers uh, shrink your books instead of keeping them big and large and hardcover like the original French bande dessinée? Well, first we said you better ask the publishers, the American publishers. But second, I guess one reason is that because, yes, they need to blend in. Because for the moment, I think uh, calling them, classifying them, or announcing publicly that they, they are European does not really sell. They just want to sell stories um, to American audience. So many, many Americans are reading European stories without knowing that they're European. And that's, that's fine for the publishers. So they don't want to create any contrast. Although I think this is slowly changing, mm -hmm. I guess. But it is true that, one, that in the US, I guess, you have very um, well standardized formats, whereas in Europe, we don't really have a standard. The only thing that's standard is that they're big. <laughs> that they're big and they're always, always hardcover. Even though the pages would be only 48, yeah, that's well, just page-wise we have this standard, 48 pages. Um, that in the US, they're either split into single issues and afterwards collected a few of our volumes in one big volume. So yeah, there is a little, a little contrast there. Um, I wonder if we're, I want to leave a lot of time for questions, um, but I just want to do a quick, maybe run down the line again, and maybe ask um, for suggestions for everyone here about what, where to start, or what to read, if you, or where to look online and for resources or, or whatever, to uh, get into the comics from where you're from. <laughs> well, Google is very good. <laughs> uh, just comics Argentina stuff for sure. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, there's not a lot of Argentinian comics published, even in Argentina, which is kind of sad. That there's always been very good at taking care of the graphic humor. So, like I said before, the people that were in the newspapers, they published these little characters, or, uh, and Daily strips, those generally uh, Argentinian publishers will publish. But a lot of Argentinian authors are way more better known in Europe and even in the United States than in Argentina, like uh, Munoz and Sampaggio and, and uh, Atuna. There's all these guys that when I go with them to, to Lyon or Angoulême or whatever, they are rock stars. You know, people are live for hours and hours and in Argentina nobody knows them which is heartbreaking because you know it's I would have been like I am very bad with using like very black you know like in my, in my comics are very like colorful because I, I I'm scared of just the black thing <laughs> and I would have been way better with that if I would have read uh, Munoz's books you know that there's an amazing Billy Holiday one that's out there so uh, that kind of sucks, and I, when I started, Macanudo started, which is my daily strip, started selling really well, and it was, oh, nice, <laughs> yeah, they started selling some books, there was money coming in, 
And we said, well, let's you know, put our money where our mouth is. So we started publishing graphic novels in Argentina, which was not happening. And another reason that was not happening in all of Latin America was that Spain, a lot of times, buying the rights for a graphic novel for the whole Spanish-speaking universe. You know, and what happens is that these books get published in Spain, so you can find Chris Ware and Daniel Klaus and you know all these amazing books in Spain, and they will send like 50 copies to a comic book store in Buenos Aires and be That's super it. expensive for like the nerd that buys them. But it, so we tried and when we started publishing graphic novels to publish Joe Sacco, to publish Daniel Klaus, to publish a lot of these books, and we couldn't because they would not give us the right to publish. So that, that I think is a big problem and, and uh, but you know go to my publishing thing <laughs> which is La Editorial Común, mm -hmm. it's in Común, uh, it's in Comunism and because and, uh, there are amazing new graphic novel artists in the whole of Latin America and they were not being paid attention to the, the you know, and nobody sits down and draws 200 pages and just, just to keep them in a, so they need to feel that there's somewhere that they can publish. So we started publishing what we could of those stuff, uh, of that stuff, and it kind of started to, you know, to make a noise. Mm -hmm. And I would really encourage, like, whatever publisher to pay attention to Latin America because it's a weird little continent, it has its own crazy. Going on down there. So what happened with Latin, with Latin American literature boom in the 60s with Mario Vargas Llosa, Jorge Garcia Marquez, Cortázar, etc., could definitely happen with Latin American comics because it's not the same as European novels. It's not the same as North American novels. They are really nuanced and different and weird and just you know, it's perfect. So Quebec comics are uh, also a whole thing unto themselves. Uh, any hot tips for us? Um, well, um, I, I could give tips. I was thinking of tips for French comics. Sure. Too. So yeah. um, yeah. <laughs> um, my gift was signing at a, a, a place that I, I didn't even know existed, which is an association for, for the promotion of uh, French uh, comics, mm -hmm. uh, Bande dessinée Française. And they have a stand here. Uh, so that would be the first place I could go if I wanted to explore French comics. Um, and the, the people there are really eager to show you what, whatever has been translated into English. And I think they show books from different publishers here in the US that have been translated from uh, French books. So, um, and these guys um, apparently have um, something online so you can totally discover new stuff there. And so a lot of good comics from all over, uh, from Montreal, from, uh, from, from France, are translated into English. They're often published by small niche, what's that, how do you pronounce that? Niche, yeah. niche publishers, and uh, they might be harder to find because they're not published by these huge big publishers, so you have to do a little bit of research. And another, one last tip that I would give you is to try to look up what uh, UK is doing, because they're closer physically to, uh, and they translate different titles. So you would uh, discover titles in English that are translated from French work, um, and uh, they also have cool magazines that uh, show uh, that showcase some of the, the publications. Like I think they had parts of my latest books in Anna magazine. So mm -hmm. if you look up these British magazines that show off um, comic books in French translated into English, you'll discover a lot more stuff there. So that would be my advice. Yes. Please Thank you. Oui, sur le stand de. Yes, on the stand of the French Comics Association, you can find many. Puis sinon aussi, uh, bah, Dr. 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 Sinon, euh, Montreal. Montreal, yeah, but they have European. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And, and also Montreal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sinon, il y a des jeunes euh, dessinateurs africains qui sont assez bons, mais malheureusement, il euh, euh, a pas beaucoup de struct
Afrique. Et donc, euh, ils essaient eux-mêmes d'éditer de, de, leur, 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 leur livre. Et euh, on peut la trouver sur, bah, sur, sur Google. Euh, And apart from that, there are many emerging and tal very talented African uh, comics uh, creators. Of course, they don't have the, the, the structure, the system uh, to, to be published uh, officially, so they publish themselves their books, and these you can find them online. Yes, and so, unfortunately, they are the only ones who are published by editors in France. In fact, we ask them to tell always des choses sur des, des sujets, euh, c'est très pédagogique, didactique, euh, euh, sur l'expérience de la guerre, le truc, et du coup, <rire> c'est pas très passionnant, mais... <rire> And unfortunately, the ones that are published in France, or by important publishers, that the African artist that is, uh, they are always asked to tell sad stories, they're always asked to tell uh, about wars, and just subjects that are not really exciting. Je les, je, les, je les conseille vivement d'aller sur Google et de, 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 de découvrir d'autres voilà, histoires avec des, 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 justement des, des jeunes talentueux qui, qui racontent autre chose. So my suggestion is to go on Google and look for the other artists who tell different stories about Africa. Or as me. Um, I would suggest Europe Comics because what you forgot to mention is that we also publish books in digital. We have uh, more than now 300. Um, um, basically, we're a group of European uh, publishers, as we said, uh, but mostly we have mostly books from the French and the Belgian, the big ones, and also some Italian, just like uh, Perez and, and Stefano's books, Italian, Spanish, Polish, Serbian, uh, <coughs> and um, Turkish also books. So uh, they're all in English, they're all available digitally on all big platforms and also through the American libraries, uh, thanks to Overdrive. So there, uh, just go on eurocomics.com um, and you can see our catalog. If you're looking for print books, we have a pro page where we have a list of books, uh, Franco-Belgian comics published in the US by Joan Portigny and BM, uh, Titan, and Sight, and all the other publishers. I don't know how many of the Italian comics my stores <laughs> have been published in English, but uh, I would suggest if you want to do Google them and just to work to look at their art and of course I would suggest the Michel Uzi, Platt and uh, uh, what do you Topi Topi. <laughs> Topi Topi is fantastic because you just can just look at the pictures and even if you don't understand uh, what is written it's just art. And, uh, uh, he does stories really through pictures. And as far as the artists of today are concerned, um, I think uh, uh, there is something by GP. Uh, who is one of our? Well, he's marvelous, uh, and uh, <laughs> I can't find the books. And I think something by him is yes, yeah. is yeah. translated in uh, into America. So yeah. uh, go and look for him. <laughs> I, if I can just um, add a little note on the Italian. So uh, Hugo Pratt, uh, Corto Maltese, is published by IDW, uh, okay, the perfect. Euro Euro Comics imprint. Uh, there are some Italian books also published by Magnetic Press, by Forge and uh, GP by uh, first second. Uh, so let's uh, get some questions from uh, all of you. We'll start with you, sir. Yeah, thank you so much for coming and sharing you know, about comics. Um, I'm curious, uh, Frederick Wortham was probably the most prominent US censor of comics. Um, and I'm curious if, in your own countries, if you, if you have any Wortham-like figures that have acted as like censors that have kind of just sort of acted to sort of legislate against comics and and, and, and that, and, and if not, I'd have a follow-up question about just censorship in general, if, if not. Um, we don't have anything like that uh, in Quebec that I know of. Um, if someone was trying, probably have a lot of problems, because people wouldn't like them. Um, it doesn't happen at all. And censorship, um, I would say, I feel that, um, my uh, my specific uh, territory, which is Montreal and Quebec, is the freest uh, regarding the ch choices of topics, and uh, uh, nobody ever told me what to write about or not write about anywhere in, in Quebec. It happened to me a little bit more in France, but not like in France are very very open-minded about what you can talk about in a book. 
and that uh, it happens a lot more here. Um, not necessarily censorship, but like um, decisions over what you can and cannot talk about in the book. Yeah, in Argentina there was, <clears throat> right now, the moment that I, I, I got to work was really a very good moment, because it was, uh, democracy in Argentina started in 1983, and from then onwards, the you know freedom of speech is kind of you know taken care of. Every now and then, someone can lean into someone. I don't know. Generally, more with journalists, nobody cares about cartoonists at all. But in the during the, yes, the dictatorship years, the, there was like horrible stories. The the most chilling one is the the Eternaut, this book that I just told that Fantagraphics that published last year. It was this 300 page story, uh, science fiction story, but it's horribly connected to the author 20 years after the book because he and his four daughters and two sons in laws they all were disappeared by the dictatorship in a year. So imagine just this family disappeared, just only the widow. And re reading the book, The Eternal, with that in mind is super chilling because it's, it's just. He has this. As I told you also, my, my publisher did the little indoctrinating for kids. <laughs> so it was very hard for a while to do comics or, or sing or do movies or whatever in Argentina. People kind of find different ways just to circumvent that. A lot of people had to flee the country. But if you were very, like, they could disappear you if they kind of if you were kind of known, but if you were really known, they couldn't touch you, because then the whole country would So musicians, and the, there was this one magazine called Humor, Humor, which was very in your face towards the dictatorship, and it, uh, in a very courageous moment, I think. But after that, after 1983, I, uh, yeah, I, I was really lucky, and it changed the culture a lot, so, the comics of that time and the, the literature of that time, the music of that time is very social, uh, like, you know, uh, activism is very present, whereas what's going on later in years is kind of like more relaxed and everybody can, can tell their own story instead of just going, you know, trying to move the masses of <laughs> this big uh, thing. But we are lucky that they did that at that point because a lot of those guys were the guys that took the stand, a lot of them pay the price. So it's, uh, you know, we are lucky not to be in that context. I have no idea how I would work in that context. Like, it would destroy me as a cartoonist. En France, on n'a pas, on est assez libre de raconter, de raconter ce qu'on veut. On a même des dessinateurs qui, qui suivent même. Le président. <laughs> In France, we're very, very free. We could write and uh, draw about anything we like. We even have uh, some comics artists who follow the president. Et de pouvoir raconter tout ce qu'il fait, comme uh, par exemple Mathieu Sapin et son fameux château. <laughs> like uh, Mathieu Sapin, he's one of those uh, who wrote uh, a book called Château. Uh, Le Château, oui, Le il a suivi pendant un an uh, François Hollande. So yes, he followed, it's not published in English yet, he followed uh, François Hollande uh, one, for one year and he wrote the book uh, following. Uh, c'est très intéressant d'ailleurs. Uh, so it's very interesting. Mais c'est vrai que bon, depuis les événements quand même de Charlie Hebdo, il faut le dire, euh, on, voilà, on peut, on a quand même, euh, on peut pas tout raconter. Enfin, en tout cas, enfin. But unfortunately, after Charlie Hebdo, yes, we cannot really tell everything. Not all of us can tell everything we like. But <laughs> it's not true that we can tell, but we are a bit more cautious. There are some <laughs> subjects uh, that we cannot really make fun of anymore. But it's true that we don't have anyone who tells us on se, voilà, c'est la, c'est l'autocensure, oui. So, but it's true that we don't have se, someone uh, who tells us no, don't do this. It's more like uh, self-censorship. Mm -hmm. yeah. En fait, voilà, on peut raconter. En fait, ça dépend comment on raconte des histoires. And also it depends how you tell the story. Je pense qu'on peut, on peut mettre de, de, de façon très subtile des choses. Et, et moi, je passe beaucoup à l'humour. Je pense qu'avec euh, avec, avec l'humour, on peut, euh, voilà, on peut.
peut un peu se, se dérider. So you, you can still tell the story, but with very subt in a very subtle way. And another way of telling, uh, talking about serious things is humor, which I, I do often. I will just add something again. No, 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 no. <laughs> no I, I'm, we, we don't have, uh, we, we've never uh, found uh, censorship or things like that when we work on our own graphic novels. And there we are really very, very free. Of course, the situation is different if you work for uh, big companies uh, with their own characters. But right. that is not really censorship. For example, we've been working for Disney Comics for he for 20 years, me for 15. <laughs> we are still doing it now, but uh, less and less because uh, um, it's not uh, a matter of censorship, but it's that uh, uh, there is not one head over you, there are many. Yes. Uh, so uh, very often it happens that uh, uh, your stories that were approved several times uh, uh, as a subject, as a script, as a art, uh, and you, you, you find them when they are published completely different <laughs> and you don't know what happened in the middle. So, uh, it's not really a censorship, but it's other, other people uh, putting their hands into your words and, and, and uh, your work is not uh, anymore yours. And sometimes it's connected to censorship because uh, there are things you cannot say uh, or you cannot show, uh, but this is connected to big, uh, to this big uh, system. Um, not when we are working on, on our own world. Yes. No, just a little comment on my side because, as you said, we, we choose uh, European books, we translate into English and we publish in digital. And we have uh, met some censorship from the big uh, uh, retailers, um, Apple mainly, some, some of our covers, some of our books are not there because, and it's very funny because we have, for example, the series, it's called Gin, it's um, historical fiction with erotic elements. Um, and uh, well, yeah, the main character.